You know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we start our evening interview, uh, again, let me thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, it's a, a tad of a, an embarrassment on the part of WSA in the sense that we have tried to have a great woman figure as our honoree for many years. Um, because of mostly scheduling, Bill, people like Billie Jean King, Martina Navratilova, Chris Severance, Serena Williams, um, they couldn't do it. Or they committed to it and the last minute they had to cancel. So it's not for lack of trying. But I want everybody to know, and from the bottom of my heart, the person we are honoring tonight is one hell of a human being. And I want, yes, please, go right ahead. Now, she happens to be a woman, but she is, what, do you, what was the Bee Gees line? More than a woman? <laughs> More than a woman to me. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in a moment, I'm going to have a chance to sit down and, and, and share with you her life and times. But before we do that, Gary, we can ready that video. I want you to hear what people have had to say about the marvelous, spectacular, Allison Felix. I think. I think every, you know, young athlete, boy or girl, has looked up to Allison Felix. When people think track, they think Allison. Allison Felix was definitely the first female athlete I looked up to. Who do you think is most likely to run for office someday? Oh shoot. Oh, Allison Felix. <laughs> I watched her growing up. You know, Allison was always that girl um, since she was 18 years old, and you grew up watching Allison. I admire that not only has she done the sport, you know, as well as she's done it, but she's done it the right way with integrity and just being the best that she can be, you know, accepting the challenges that come along with it and continuing to fight through all of that. When I think about legacy, I think before I was always concerned with medals and times and like that's what I wanted to leave behind. Um, in the space that I am now, I want to leave the sport better than I found it. Allison Felix, the most decorated athlete, male or female, in World Athletics Championship history. 20 career medals, 7 from individual events, 13 from Team Rio. And with a combined Olympic and World Championship total of 31 medals, she is also the overall most decorated athlete in track and field history, 12 medals from individual events, 19 from relays. The first athlete in track and field history to medal in three different relays. But she isn't merely a historically successful track star, she's an advocate for women's rights, particularly as it applies to pregnant women or women who seek to have children while competing in sports. Ladies and gentlemen, a great champion, activist, athlete, and mother, Allison Felix. You know, uh, as I said at the top, I had never met you before. I had always been a fan. I've interviewed, I guess, close to 6,000 athletes. Uh, it's going to sound like a line because we're honoring you tonight, but I mean it. I don't know an athlete I've m more impressed with in my time than you. I really mean it. I, I really do. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a look back at Allison growing up. Uh, she's an LA, now of course woman, but she was an LA girl too. And her father was a bit of a sprinter, right? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Mother was, and by the way, your father's minister too, correct? Yes. Um, so you did, didn't have the classic genes, like for example, Carl Lewis was our honor, honoree last year. Both of his parents were athletes. Father dabbled a little bit in sprinting. Your mother was a school teacher, but she had the long legs, right? She had the long legs. So we're going to take a look at some pictures. Take us through little 
Allison Felix. Here's the first one. <laughs> um, yes, this is me and my brother Wes. Um, just growing up, uh, like you said, just LA through and through. Um, grew up right here in the heart of LA, and this was somewhere at home. <laughs> and I know that you wanted to be a basketball player, really. That was your dream, right? I did. Basketball was my first love. Um, but it was quickly apparent that that was not where my talent lied. <laughs> so I remain a huge fan, but that was not where it was at for me. You know, I, I look, I, I guess you're just about entering high school. How old do you think you Who are? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I, yes, the younger years. This is about, I guess this is give or take ninth grade. What makes this significant, this picture, folks, is she really didn't start sprinting no real interest in track until about ninth grade. You know how late that is for, for young athletes? Who, who inspired you to even try out for the track team in high school? Yeah, so I was pretty much growing up in my neighborhood. And so, um, you know, riding bikes and in community activities and things of that nature. And when I got to high school, I was at a new school and I didn't really know anybody. And so my dad and my brother encouraged me to go out to the for the track team and really just to make friends. They're mm -hmm. like, you know, sports is an awesome way to meet people. And so that's really what got me into it. I stumbled into it and, and then, you know, fell in love with it. Well, it fell in love with you too, my dear, because <laughs> really in high school, she was a world record holder in under 20 years old in the 200. And everyone started, their eyes opened. They said, who is this young girl? Sports Illustrated comes calling. And before you know it, this is your passion. Um, who lit the fire though? Was it a coach? Was it something someone said that said, I belong here, this is what I wanna do? I think it was a lot of people believing in me um, and just encouraging me. My, of course, it started at home with my family and um, them being at every single track meet and just showing up for me. And then I had an amazing high school coach who just poured into me and my friends, you know, I, the track team was like where it was just a very social thing. And so I felt really like um, I belonged there and it was a, a sense of comfort. And, um, and then I got really, I, I just thrived off the competition. I felt like this is where I belonged and this is, you know, not only was I excelling, but I started to see that opportunities were arising and it was kind of my ticket to kind of the next thing. You're a teenager and it's starting to click. But was there in the back of your mind, in the back of your soul, any doubt? And did doubt even enter into the picture? Uh, a lot of doubt probably, um, just because like you said, I didn't grow up running. It wasn't like this master plan that we had as a family. It was really just following me excelling and then it became a passion, but um, I had other interests. I thought I was gonna be an elementary school teacher. Mm. So, you know, I was following this, but I don't think I was, you know, so certain until, um, you know, a couple years later. Well, it, it's uncanny, ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you how young she was at a world-class level. It happens 17 years old, 18, 2004, the Olympics. Think about that. She was just out of high school, folks, and she's competing in the Olympic Games. It's astonishing. And I'm, I'm going to show, and I want you to narrate, because you're going to see it here on the monitor, Helsinki. This was your first world title in 2005. This is a montage of you, of course, as the sprinter. But when you get to Helsinki, this was the moment, I think, or certainly early on, one of the biggest moments of your life. It's, you know, 18 years ago. Take us through, look how young you were. Look how young that face is. <laughs> and take us through what, what just going through your mind in this incredible moment in, in your life. Yeah, just excited to be competing on this stage. The start was never my thing, as you can see right here. Um, <laughs> but I had a lot of endurance uh, workouts. And so coming off the curve, you know, this is where I'm still trying to find my stride coming into my own and the last 50 is really Look at this. Look at this folks. Look at her clothes. My Look lies. at her clothes. <laughs> How about this? This is uh, in Osaka 2 years later. Yeah, so this I had some experience under my belt um, and I was ready to kind of get under that 22 barrier that had been challenging me for a long time and um, yeah, just trying to put the race together. Better start, not 
the best start. <laughs> um, but again, coming off that curve and it kind of feeling like a slingshot effect and then really coming into my own on the, the home straight. Wow. <laughs> You know, it's a kind of corny question, but I'm going to ask it. What's it feel like to run like the wind? What's it like <laughs> to, be, to, to be out there and you know that you're the best and you're kicking butt everybody <laughs> in your field? Do you have a visceral feeling? Is it, a, is it a catharsis for you out there? For me, like when I have the races that are, they're few and far between, but the races that are as close as perfect as I've come to, um, it's almost like this state of float. It's, it feels very easy and effortless and it kind of all makes sense and it feels like it's beautiful uh, versus the races that aren't that. They feel like a lot of effort and hard. And Do so. you think about the people who are on, on the side of you or you just keep running straight, don't look at anybody else? I don't think about them, but I can definitely feel, you know, if someone is coming up and kind of where I am in relation to everyone. And as an athlete, you really know your competitors' strengths and weaknesses. So, you know, and I know my own and I know what I need to do in each circumstance of who I'm racing against to really give myself the best opportunity. Allison, do you compete with a chip on your shoulder, even if there's no chip for sure? In other words, <laughs> create the chip. Do you compete? with a little anger in you, or is it smooth, calm, don't take it personally, this is just a race. Because I know that there were some athletes, especially great track athletes, Evelyn Asher used to tell me, great, great sprinter, you, people remember Evelyn. She says, I needed to feel that these people were the competition, but almost the enemy. And I wanted to, to beat my enemy. Did you ever go down that road? I think at different points in my career, there were different different things that motivated me. I definitely um, had those experiences. I think it it shifted. I think as I became an older athlete, just kind of even my purpose in running. Um, but I, yeah, I had to play those games sometimes. <laughs> what were here? Here's another one. You're competing as a woman in, in a women's event. Were there cat fights? <laughs> were there cat fights? <laughs> <laughs> You I know what I mean? <laughs> were, there, were there certain women you didn't want to hang out with because they're the competition and they may be a little sassy and maybe they were trying to intimidate you, right? <laughs> I think sprinting is something where you have to be very fierce. You have to be very confident. And so, of course, I think it's like any other job. There's a lot of different dynamics. And so there's ups and downs with all of that. Um, but, you know, it's sports at the end of the day. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know if people realize this. Allison Felix trained for most of 20 years, five to six days a week, and then the other day she would cool down, ice, ice baths and things like that. We're talking five, six hours a day, every single day for most of 20 years. It, 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 the dedication, yeah, you should, you should applaud that. <laughs> The, the dedication, and, and I want to know if your spirit, I mean, you were such a great champion, but I want to know if your spirit was ever challenged, if you almost felt broken by, by the demands of what you were being asked to do every day. Oh, absolutely. Um, there is definitely different moments in my career. Um, right away, it, the 2008 games come to mind, where for me, that was my second Olympics, and it was really challenging, you know, I was the favorite and I had already got a silver medal at my first games. And, you know, here I was really thinking that it was a rematch and I had dedicated myself over the course of those four years and um, expecting a better result. And I got another silver medal. And I know that sounds crazy because a silver medal is amazing. <laughs> but when you're going for gold and you, have you know, four did, years. Did you feel like a failure? I did, I think more than anything, I think I really felt embarrassed um, embarrassed. I, yeah, because, you know, in the Olympics, you, you're representing your country. And for me, I felt like, you know, I was this phenom and everyone expected me to win. And so to come up short on that, it was very difficult. And I think it took me some time to kind of unpack those. But I look back now and so many valuable lessons um, I'm able to take away from them. And I think that that moment really p prepared me for a success later on. I, you know, you started to touch on it. Um, what do you think you learned about yourself in your, in your drive to be the best? I think the biggest thing I learned is that 
I love track. Um, you know, I, I'm very talented at it, but it is not who I am. You know, it's what I do. And I love what I do, but I had to really separate that, you know, and just understanding my worth and my value. I think uh, as a younger athlete, I correlated that a lot with my worth with winning races and that's how valuable I was and and being able to say that those are two separate things um, I think that was probably the greatest lesson that I was able to take away well said yeah you should <laughs> you know you look at Allison I, I met her for the first time tonight and you know you, you obviously uh, are an athlete, you have a solid figure, but you look somewhat slight because you're a sprinter. Sprinters are somewhat slight. Listen to this, folks. She could leg press 700 pounds. I mean, you like a, you you would have, you you look slight. You do, and then she could lift. And she did one lift of 300 pounds pressing. I don't, where's that power coming from with that body? <laughs> I think those are some figures from quite some time ago. Uh, <laughs> well, but, 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 but is it not true? No, uh, yes, I, back in high school, we used to lift with the football team and very competitive person. And so those challenges um, were, were always there. But, um, but yeah, sprinters, you have to be strong. You have to be able to, no matter what your body type is you still have to have a lot of power to be able to you know get down the track mm. how about music i used to see a lot of track athletes wear headphones buds or headphones they listen to music that would fire them up were you that person were you a person who liked a certain music and if so what kind of music did you listen to yeah um i definitely had like my routines and in going into the big races um, the one song that I felt like I always needed to listen to was Beyonce, I'm a Diva. <laughs> <laughs> and that was always because in my real life, I'm this very laid back person. And you know, you really have to get that alter ego going to get on the track and to perform. Wow. We are gonna take a look at, you know, w when I say this is one of the greatest feats, this is her fifth Olympics. You know, she had so many Olympics this is the one, and here's why, folks, and, and, and Allison will take it from it in a second, too. She had had a child, and we're going to talk about that issue in a moment, but she had had a child, brand, you know, brand new mom, you know, there, it's, it's, it, it's, it's your fifth Olympics, people are starting to say, she had her day, she won't make this team, we wish her well, this is her farewell, even though she won't make it this time. She, what a great career she was, and you proved everybody wrong. You made the Olympic team. So I want you to take, take us through uh, your fifth Olympic, and this is the qualifying, where it, you had to it, be in the top, I guess, three, right? Is yeah. it three? You had to finish the top three to make it, and Again, people said, oh, she's had some injuries, she's had ankle injuries, she's had a hamstring issue, she's a new mom. It's, it's sort of her farewell tour, say goodbye, she's not going to make the team, and you did make the team. And what it was like to have the family there, your husband there, and your daughter there, take us through this incredible moment. Here we okay. go. Well, let me tell you, one thing about me is I hate to watch myself race, so I don't really know what we're about to see. <laughs> so uh, it'll be in real time. Um, yeah, you know, getting ready in the box, like you said, there was a lot of adversity to overcome to come to this moment. That's my baby, my husband, my mom. Um, she's just, you know, doesn't really get all that's happening <laughs> at this moment, but it was just, so special to be able to come here and to be able to compete for this final Olympic Games. And I get out, um, the first 200 is usually the best part of my race. I, I don't like the 400 meters. I don't know how many of you have ran it. It's not the most fun race. <laughs> I'm a sprinter at heart, so this is a step up for me. So it's like, um, a, mar like a marathon almost yeah. for you, right? This third 100 is like, this is the worst spot for me. <laughs> As you see, I start to drop back way too much, and I leave a lot of work for myself to do. Um, and then coming home, I always have this moment like, okay, if, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen now. And 
just give it all you got at this point and um, try to get in that top three spot. So I'm, I'm working my way there. <laughs> look at the joy. Look at the joy in your family and look at your joy. Can you put a, can, can you put a, a, a value on joy? No, I mean, no, uh, it was just, yeah, extremely, extremely a special moment, and especially to have my daughter there. Would you um, say it's your most special moment just making that team and competing again? Yeah, definitely. For me, I think this was a moment that was bigger than medals or time. You know, it was really about being a representation to other people and to women especially Yeah. to be able to make that team. Yeah. We... Uh, we did mention, uh, she did, we just did mention Cameron. You're, she's now four and a half, right? She is, yes. But this, this is a short clip, but it's a selfie video. And I wanna show, before we roll this, this is Allison and her child. And she, you can see this in a short second, few seconds, empowering her little girl. Watch. I'm special. I'm special. I'm smart. I'm smart. I can do hard things. I can do hard things. I'm going to have a good day. I'm going to have a good day. <laughs> this child was so very important and vital in your life and your husband. Um, but it was a struggle. It was a struggle because you had to hide your pregnancy. You had to hide it to a point where, and some may know this, some may not, that Allison would compete at four o'clock in the morning so as not to be outed, if you will, because in this, this case, Nike, but a, a lot of the shoe companies and a lot of the apparel companies, they don't want their female athletes getting pregnant. And you pay a price for that. You literally get cut financially. Even if you're not pregnant, you get cut financially in, in different situations. But this child and, this, and your family, I want you to take, a, take us through a, these pictures of what this child represented to you and why you fought the system to, for all women, not just for you, but all women and the right to become a mom and compete. God bless you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it we was, got the pictures here. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Um, I went through a very difficult time um, in fighting for maternal protections for female athletes. And really, I was just motivated because there are so many women who came before me who went through the same thing. And um, many of them, you know, were under NDAs. They couldn't speak about it, couldn't talk about it. But asking for maternal protections, what that is in track and field is our contracts are performance-based. And so you go to the Olympics, you go to world championships, you get a bonus. You don't, you get a reduction. But if you, you take a pay cut. But if you have a baby during that time, there is nothing in place to protect you. And so I, the financial issue was one thing, but what I turned my attention to was asking for time to be able to recover from having a baby and not just time for myself, but time for all female athletes. And so I was told that I could have the time, but when I received the contract back, there was no mention of maternity, there was no tie to pregnancy. And hmm. so what I learned is that they were willing to grant me the time, but they weren't willing and ready to set the precedent for all female athletes. And I think because you know, I had my daughter and I thought about you know, just the world that she's gonna grow up in, that gave me that push that I needed to mm -hmm. speak about this. Because mm -hmm. I'm just a person who doesn't want to rock the boat. I, I don't want to cause yeah, I was going to ask you if you looked at yourself initially as an activist, or is that a scary? Oh, not at all. That, that was a terrifying word to me. I think I was really just wanted to be the best partner to all of my sponsors. I wanted to focus on my sport. And it wasn't until I started going through these real life situations and understanding that I had the opportunity to use my platform to try to create some change. That's what led me into that path. And being, becoming a mother and realizing like this is so much bigger than me, um, it led me to speak out on these issues. Unbelievable, just great. 
there was, there was it, in, in reading her accounts of her life, uh, this quote really touched me. The desperation and the fear that you felt in 2018 when you worked out in the darkness at four in the morning so no one would know about your pregnancy. You said, quote, I was six months pregnant and I was scared enough to train in the dark so that no one would see the life that was growing inside me. Yeah, it was a, a, a very challenging time and I'm someone who I've always wanted to be a mother. So having those moments, having to have them in secrecy and not getting to celebrate with you know the, the people that I love the most, it made it even more challenging. Um, but really grateful that I was able to speak out and that Nike did change their policy. Well, I want to stop okay. you. <laughs> Am I jumping ahead? No, no, no. <laughs> I want to stop her because, and I'm not putting words in your mouth. They, they came around. But I wonder, Allison, if you could be honest about this and say they came around not because they were altruistic and they wanted to do the right thing, but because they might have been afraid of getting sued. They might have been afraid of you filing suit with other athletes saying, this, my friends, is discrimination. You cannot discriminate against a woman because she's pregnant or get, we get less money or we get less benefits or whatever you get less of because we d dared to become pregnant. So I, I know you don't hate Nike. Yeah. You have a lot of friends still at Nike. But they're portrayed as, well, they really finally did the right thing. I wonder and again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, if they didn't do it out of fear. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's no secret that it was a huge disappointment for me that it took such a fight to have this happen. And I parted ways, you know, with them over this. Um, I would have loved- Is that scary too? Terrifying. I mean, I knew it's Nike, you know, it's this massive organization. Um, and I was really proud of the things that we had done over the past 10 years. So it was difficult to go through that. Um, but I am grateful for them changing the policy. I think it's incredible for the women who are, you know, competing now and the women that will come up. And that's the ultimate goal. I mean, it's unfortunate that it didn't work out for, for me and I had to move forward. But I think that's what sometimes that's how you create change. It doesn't always work for you, it's about other people. Whether, whether she wants to use the word activist or not, listen to this. She was included in Time Magazine's 100 most influential people, not 100 most influential athletes, most influential people in 2020 and 2021. The following year, last year, Allison received an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree, and she was given the incredible privilege of being the commencement speaker at the University of Southern California. <laughs> and, and on top of that, just a few months ago, they renamed the track at USC, Allison Felix. Track. So I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to play just a very short snippet of your commencement. I watched it. I had tears in my eyes. I'm sitting in my bed watching this thing saying, man, this is some kind of human being. Because what you said was so heartfelt and so powerful and so inspirational. This is only about 15 seconds, but this is part of a speech that moved me to tears and a lot of people in the audience. Watch. All right, so here are the things that I wish that I had learned earlier. Your voice has power, and you have to use your voice even if it shakes. There are times when you'll ask for change, and there are times when you'll have to create it. Your life has purpose, so it's important to live a life of purpose. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> you, you know, I, as you said, you, I, don't even, I don't know if shy would be the right word, but you were somewhat of an introvert as a young, young person. You said you didn't like to rock the boat. But do you, do you get inspired by even your own words? Do you say, I really do believe this. I really do believe my life has purpose. I really do I've made, feel like I've made an impact in the rest of this world. And I want to make even more of it. I've heard somebody, somebody at the beginning say she should run for office. You know, um, 
do you feel when you hear your own words, and, and I know that came from the heart, that, you, that you've made a difference? Yeah, when I reflect back on my career and um, just the things that I've been able to do, I feel extremely blessed and I feel um, that I never would have imagined this. Like I, there's not in my wildest dreams what I have dreamt um, that the that life would take me in these places. And I'm really grateful for all the experiences um, and just for being open to some of the own unknown things that have come my way. What do you think you learned most about yourself? Mm. I think, I guess I learned, I think in a lot of moments um, of transition or whether it was about speaking out, there was a lot of fear um, and a lot of different moments. And I, I guess what I learned is that there's just freedom on the other side of that, you know, whether it is taking a big step, a big risk in, in speaking out. I was absolutely terrified to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think once I did that, I, I realized that there was a sense of freedom and then that something came from that. So I think instead of being, you know, letting fear paralyze you and not moving forward, understand that you're not gonna have this perfect moment of just feeling ready for these moments, but that doesn't have to stop you. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's just putting that one foot in front of the other and keep going. You know, I, uh, I, I was thinking about adding something tonight, a clip tonight from Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Denzel speaks at commencement speech, does commencement speeches like you did. Uh, he did it at Penn, and that's part of what we're about to see in a second here. But what he said in this clip, I thought only about you when I was watching this because I said, you had a lot of lonely times mm -hmm. and fearful times. Am I doing the right thing? Am I risking my career? Am I putting it on the line? Am I blowing this whole thing for something that's sort of maybe even a pipe dream? We'll talk about the shoe company that you put together too in a second. But I want you to listen to what Denzel said. This reminded me of you, Allison. Watch. To get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Les Brown, the motivational speaker, he made an analogy about this. He says, imagine you're on your deathbed, and standing around your deathbed are the ghosts representing your unfulfilled potential, the ghost of the ideas you never acted on, the ghost of the talents you didn't use, and they're standing around your bed, angry, disappointed, and upset. They say, we, we came to you because you could have brought us to life, they say. And now we have to go to the grave together. So I ask you today, how many ghosts are going to be around your bed when your time comes? So you got to get out there. You got to give it everything you got, whether it's your time, your, your, your talent, your prayers, or your treasures. What are you going to do with what you have? Because the chances you take, the people you meet, the people you love, the faith that you have, that's what's going to define you. Never be discouraged. Never hold back. Mm. Give everything you've got. And when you fall throughout life, remember this. Fall forward. Whew. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's been quite a journey for you, my dear. Yes. And <laughs> the journey still continues because you've put together your own shoe company, your own style of shoe. It's called, is it Seish? Is it pronounced yes, Seish? Seish? What does Seish mean? Um, so Seish is actually a type of wave, and we spell it phonetically, but it's found in enclosed bodies of water. And when atmospheric pressure brings the water to one side, it's the Seish wave that restores balance. And so that's what um, my company is about in the marketplace. We want to bring balance. We make footwear for women to fit the form of a female foot. And how can people acquire this footwear? Is it yeah. online? It's an online? Yeah, you can go to sage.com. Um, we're also in Foot Locker um, and at, at, at Fleta. Um, and so you can find us there. Mm. Um, this is a bittersweet question to talk about at the end. You just lost a very dear friend, um, Tori Bowie who was a teammate. And the irony, folks, even though it's not necessarily directly related to competing as an athlete, she died in childbirth, which uh, it's, it's so, such a tragedy. It shows, too, the ordeal that some women have problems in pregnancy. Sometimes it's stress-related. 
but she lost her. Are we? I think we have a picture of Tori, but you know, I, I look at, there she is, uh, we just lost her a few weeks ago. Um, you, you can applaud the greatness of Tori Bowie. She was a teammate. Um, just how did it, how, obviously you, you were hurt like everybody was heartbreaking, but it, it, in a strange, I, almost eerie way, the things that you were fighting for, freedom for, ch for people to have a child and still be athletes, even though her career was over, it, it, and she lost her life in pregnancy and in, in giving birth. Yeah, Tori um, had such a sweet spirit and such an infectious smile. Um, but it was real, very heartbreaking to know that she died from childbirth. Um, it's an issue that is very close to my heart. I had my daughter two months early, suffered a severe case of preeclampsia. Could you, could you have lost that child? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, women of color are at risk. Um, and this is, I think the thing that is so heartbreaking is, you know, I gave birth in 2018 and here we are in 2023 and this is a growing problem for women of color. And it just, my experience opened my eyes. It made me just want to do more. And, um, and then to have this happen with Tori is just so devastating. And I think it is a, another wake up call just to, uh, of the work that we have to do to combat these issues that mm. um, women are facing. It should not be this dangerous to give birth here in America in 2023. Mm. We, we are almost out of time. I hope you will all agree this is a very special human being. We got. Um, I do, I do want to address one thing though, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot because this is a very com complicated uh, issue. You are a gender a person that believes in gender equity, and there is a complication in transgender athletes. Um, you, I know that you are a person who is very active and wants human rights to be honored and respected, whether LGBT, straight, whatever you want to call it. But it is a complicated issue. I remember interviewing Martina, a Mar Maverick to level, who is obviously gay and very much a gender equity person. And she says, it's just so complicated. And it's hard for me to give you a black and white answer. Oh, yes, you should, or no, you shouldn't. Do you, you care to comment on this? It, because it could become an issue in the years ahead in track and field. Yeah, I agree that it is a complicated issue. But um, I just think that everyone should be included in sports. Sports has the power to transform. Um, it has meant so much in my life, and it is a complicated issue, but it's one that I think that we need to get right because people's lives um, are affected by it. And so, um, obviously, I'm not the one to make any decisions, but I just think that we should be inclusive. Mm hmm Right. I, I, get, I get goosebumps when I talk to people like her. You don't see them every day. I've interviewed... People like Arthur Ashe, who met Muhammad Ali, was my friend for 45 years. People who have changed the world. I think you have changed the world. And um, I want to reflect on one last word, a single word. It's the most important word in the universe. And you can interpret this, this one word and reflect on this one word in any way you choose. And the word is love. Mm. The love of what you did, the love and how you did it, the love of your family, but reflect on that, the power of love. Yeah, um, such a powerful word. Um, I guess when I think about love, I think about all the people who have poured into my life. There are many people who have come before me, many mentors, family members. I just, I truly believe that you don't have success alone. I know that I, there's nothing that I've accomplished by myself. It is such a team effort, it's such a family thing. Um, there's just so many people who are involved, and I think that we probably all can relate to that. Um, so when I think about love, I think about all the people who have helped me and who have encouraged me, who have empowered me, and who have allowed me um, to have the opportunities that I do. So well said, just so well said. You know, when you think about that love, you've returned that love, Allison. Yeah. You've put the world on your shoulders, women on your shoulders, and they 
where uh, their lives will be better as athletes and in terms of the consideration of pregnancy for, like you mentioned before, the social issues too, the stigmas and the difficulties for, for especially women of color in pregnancy. But you've returned the love. Yeah. And I know your family is proud of you. I know the University of Southern California and the greater good of the world is proud of you. So I would like to read this to you. This is our award, 2023, our first ever woman athlete. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm kind of sorry that it took 28 years to get here. To Allison Felix, in recognition of your athletic accomplishments and your commitment to the youth, youth, of, youth sports in Southern California, you are the honoree for 2023, the Roy Firestone Award in Making Youth Sports Possible. Thank you so much. Wanna stand together? Okay, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so good to Thank see you. you.